All right. Thanks, everybody, for indulging me and moving around. Um, now we're going to kick off our other speaker, and then we have John Stewart. He's going to be talking about the open web in healthcare, how to leverage Drupal for web application development. John Stewart is the president and co-founder of ZenSource, an enterprise-grade open source platform offering a Drupal-based CMS and secure cloud hosting platform. With roots in leading technical architecture and full-stack web development, his focus is designing and implementing customer experience platform solutions and driving the vision of ZenSource. John is an innovative leader when it comes to providing MarTech solutions in highly regulated industries such as higher education, healthcare, manufacturing, and financial services. So, all right, thank you, John. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, a little bit about who we are. So ZenSource, we are an open source platform uh, combining Drupal CMS and AWS for our cloud hosting offering. So we're a little bit product company, a little bit development partner. Um, we are part of a parent company called Digital United and we partner with two other agencies, Primacy, that's our full service digital agency, and immediately that is our media company. Um, the interesting thing about ZenSource is that we were born out of the agency primacy. Um, myself and uh, our chief architect in the audience, Jake, um, started the, the group and we were developing websites on a whole variety of different platforms. Sitecore, Sitefinity, Drupal, WordPress, Ektron, you know, all across the board and we kind of came to a realization that, well, you know, Drupal with the release, release of eight was a whole new ball game in terms of the authoring experience and the security and the upgrade paths and we're seeing our clients flock to it um, more and more, and we made a decision to build an offering, um, healthcare specific, around that um, to help accelerate our clients' web builds and their redesigns. So um, we focus primarily in health education, financial services, and manufacturing, um, and together with our companies, we do everything through strategy, marketing, creative, tech, and media. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about a few different things, and we have some agency folks in the room. I know we have some client side folks in the room. I'm gonna talk a little bit about you know, why Drupal makes sense in healthcare and why we're seeing such a rapid adoption um, and what we're hearing from our clients and why they're gravitating towards it. Um, we're gonna talk a bit about data security uh, and the types of things we're doing in terms of securing the data that we collect or we transfer on our websites. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we ensure the ease of use of the admin experience, um, particularly in healthcare. We're working with quite often lots and lots of authors, subject matter experts, PR teams, et cetera, across different systems, different groups, and um, I'll talk a little about how we approach that and we onboard. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what a health system Drupal at scale looks like in an approach that we've taken and architected to integrate health systems with various hospitals, delivery networks, et cetera, and make it all feel cohesive and work together. And I'll do a little bit of a case study there and um, talk a little about you know, things to consider, cost of ownership. Um, yeah, okay. So why Drupal makes sense in healthcare? Um, so what our clients are telling us, um, that lower cost entry point versus the proprietary platforms is just freeing up so much more resources, more budget, more team members to really do more of the custom brand needs. Um, optimizing that brand, whether we're coming in from a redesign or a replatform, um, when you look at the, the price comparison of some of these proprietary platforms, just the licensing in addition to what it costs to host and support, um, it's harder for organizations to realize their digital strategy. And um, by coming in with Drupal, um, and having this open source foundation, this community that we can pull from and leverage and build on, um, we're just finding that our clients are able to do a lot more, um, customize more, be more agile, and um, get in market faster and better. Um, also, of course, the openness with the third party integration um, is making it much easier to invest in that foundation while also scaling it and extending it. Um, with various third-party tools and things that we're going to use over time, you know, whether that's credentialing databases or event platforms or um, health library content, things of that nature. Um, and the security standards of the community, um, you know, one of the, as we know, kind of all the, you know, myths or you know, previous preconceptions around open source is, oh, well, is it secure? 
Um, and you know, we're, the way that in which we tell the story and we build a solution that is secure, the way that we maintain Drupal, the way that we build security and cloud around it, um, usually is the is the easiest way for us to, to work with our clients to say, yes, we've got this really um, nimble solution, this really flexible solution, but we've also built an enterprise level security and, and, and here's how we do it. Um, and just kind of in a nutshell, um, it's, you know, we're hearing from our clients more and more that when they're migrating to Drupal, um, they're just being able to do more in less time and really realize their, their roadmaps, their digital strategies. The, the majority of healthcare clients we work with after a implementation, um, whether it's a one-to-one -one migration or it's a, uh, you know, new redesign, replatform, we're seeing that their two, three, four-year investments are going a lot further and getting out of that maintenance mode that we've seen with some of these, you know, really heavy, complex, expensive proprietary platforms. So it's exciting to see where that goes. Um, and as we're looking at uh, onboarding our, our healthcare clients to, um, to Drupal, um, we've basically come across the idea that there is essentially six different facets of needs that we hear in healthcare, that we see in healthcare across the board. Um, these are the things that every pitch, every CMS assessment we go into, um, and honestly, not even just in healthcare, but across all the industries we work in, these are the, the imperatives, the, the key imperatives we need for CMS and you know, extending to that DXP. Um, the frictionless site user experience, the intuitive layout builder driven experience, what we can do to polish the ad and what we can do to fine tune it. Um, having it be a consistent brand across all properties, that's becoming a really important one as we're working with more health systems that are introducing other locations and microsites. Um, other full hospital sites within this central um, system and being able to kind of decentralize the authoring but maintain the brand consistency uh, is, is really crucial. Um, a scalable content author experience, um, proven solution for systems integration, being able to extend and connect with other third party tools with ease, and uh, of course consolidating and migrating content and doing that in a way where we can automate the, uh, the content that we want to bring over in a way that's structured, um, as well as you know, the unstructured content, the content population, how do we make that easier? So what we, what we decided to do was focus our efforts on Drupal and healthcare and say, okay, how can we build tools in Drupal and AWS for that matter and build the team and offerings around these different things to help our clients? So what we essentially did was we built a um, foundational Drupal distribution of our own where we spent years fine tuning the admin experience, making sure all the modules were tried and true that we were using, um, you know, security board rev um, reviewed, all the modules are green, um, gathering client feedback, what works for them, what doesn't work for them, how can we make it better, more intuitive, and we have a team that we're focused purely on continuously evolving and optimizing this. So then we do our initial install, We've got this, you know, this low-code design system and a really robust taxonomy engine um, that allows us to maintain that brand consistency. Um, what we also wanted to do uh, as part of that was build a series of different things from a security perspective um, to make sure that anything that's getting stored or passed uh, is doing so in a, um, you know, in a in a in a, be in a way of best practices. Which, if anybody has more technical questions after on exactly how we do that. Um, Jake in the audience is our guy for that, but ensuring that the things that we build using Drupal Forms, for example, we're, um, you know, we're harnessing key management, we're encrypting things the right way in transit and at rest, um, things like that. And then um, using things like the Drupal Migrate API and extending our own scripts to help speed up that content migration process. So these are all things that we kind of saw those, these needs, these trends, and we built these offerings around it. So. What we did was essentially evolved six different key offerings. So we've got this Drupal distribution that's healthcare optimized. Um, we've got a, what we call Zen CMS, where we have a practice um, in process of maintaining all the security patches and module updates, but we're also doing all the incremental and major version upgrades as part of that. Um, our cloud, which I'll talk about a bit more and, and, and how that works and how we've developed that specific to more regulated industries. Um, we've also built out a design system, uh, you know, full suite of, of modules, templates, page layouts, et cetera, that we partner with our UX and creative counterparts to use as a foundation um, when we build, and then, um, you know, offering support 
um, ongoing, and um, we have a few other variety of tools that we use for things like marketing accelerators for lead gens and uh, um, lead generation um, events, virtual tours, um, things of that nature. So in terms of um, data security, um, you know, it's, it's no surprise to anyone that patient data is not negotiable in healthcare um, and now today more than ever. With the internet of things growing, with the, the threat of breaches, um, the amount of people just trying to spam sites and the malicious traffic coming through, um, it's something that we need to have more attention to now than ever. Um, and you know, when we look at the modern world of open source and Drupal, um, we need to do two things. We need to secure the Drupal application um, to the best of our abilities, um, but also build a cloud around it um, that, is, that is very secure and um, following all the different things we need to do from a PCI HIPAA compliance perspective. Um, and as I mentioned, um, one thing we talk about commonly is that um, for any developers that are actively Building sites on Drupal, getting that security team um, role in the community is a really smart thing to do to help um, vet modules and get modules passed through. We're seeing uh, more and more clients and their IT teams coming in and being um, very open to Drupal or already on Drupal, but are asking that we build sites entirely with modules that are cleared um, or have a very good reason for why they're not. So um, getting that role is something that um, um, can be very helpful um, when working, working with more regulated regulated industries and regulated clients. Um, so, you know, and kind of like the five key tips that we'll take away there from how we look to secure Drupal, um, starting with that secure foundation um, and then building that robust cloud infrastructure. You know, there's so many great tools out there, so many different great cloud providers. Um, you know, some of our clients have their own internal AWS um, infra or I shouldn't say internal because it's in the cloud, but their own AWS teams and the <coughs> AWS offerings that they're maintaining. Um, and then, you know, deploying that process, that team to make sure that all the updates are um, patched and up to date and also staying on top of the incremental and major version upgrades, building with as little custom code as possible to make those upgrade paths easier and more seamless and less error prone, um, or you know, staying on top of that practice and not getting behind in those updates is key. Um, another big thing that we found to be really helpful is putting in more of proactive security as a service. So um, doing more regular vulnerability scanning and penetration testing. You know, most health core organization IT departments are already doing this, um, but if they're not or they want to have um, other, you know, another partner help with that, that's something that um, we've been doing as well to do, you know, monthly scans, um, reports, remediation is necessary and just more of that proactive ongoing testing from a security perspective to make sure that um, you know, we're not introducing new vulnerabilities as we you know, evolve uh, our sprints and our releases. And then wherever possible, um, wherever we can um, secure data, but also minimize what needs to be collected. Um, that is also um, a key piece. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, you know, not collecting data just for the sake of collecting it, um, making sure that we're locking down um, our forms in a way of collecting what's absolutely essential. Um, is, is always going to be um, smart to have a, a lower footprint there. And then, um, uh, you know, education of staff, whether that's uh, on the agency side, on the client side, um, doing more regular security um, trainings, uh, keeping employees up to date on what the different compliance needs are, the different changes, as well as just their own infraternal, internal infrastructure and best practices on their own machines. Um, that's something that we do uh, more regularly. Um, so that we're not only helping secure our clients, but we're also helping secure you know, our own teams and, and, and make sure that everybody's aware of um, what all the different needs are. Um, so what we did there was um, we looked at that and said, okay, let's develop our, our own cloud architecture that is going to give us the flexibility and the security we need for our clients. Um, so what we do is we build um, dedicated environments for each one of our clients on AWS. Um, it's, we built a fully containerized environment that auto scales over time. So um, as usage gets higher and more resources need to be brought online, um, we're bringing on additional resources, additional containers on demand to respond to the traffic and then they scale back down when they're not needed, which allows us to you know, have a really um, high performing cloud while also keeping the cost um, relatively low. Um, utilizing things like AWS CloudFront and Varnish to optimize speed and performance, um, 
staying on top of the security scanning, um, the WAF rules, um, and then adding extra layers for advanced DDoS protection, um, deep vault storage. These are all different features and kind of customizations that we have, but um, what we're basically trying to do there is all the different things from a compliance perspective that's going to make the site and the cloud around the application as secure as possible. Um, so we're also looking more specifically at HIPAA and PCI compliance of best practices. Again, you know, having an IDS in place with audit logging and it's tracking all the interactions in the application, um, making sure that we're encrypting data in transit and at rest, um, and then, you know, configuring the IDS to have um, any changes, any alerts, um, trigger our cloud team um, proactively, automatically, so that as things change in the environment or something doesn't look quite right, um, whatever that might be, we're getting those regular alerts and we have a team that's that's constantly looking at it and constantly um, making enhancements. Is there a custom dashboard? Uh, this is the IDS dashboard. Um, we have custom dashboards specific to our you know, cloud self-service environment. Um, that we've built, um, you know, for you know, database backups, code deploy, things of that nature. But yeah, this is uh, utilizing um, uh, the out of the box um, platform to be customized for the IDS. Uh, the intrusion detection. So we use Wazoo for that. Okay, so you know, the next piece too, um, as we approach our builds, um, ensuring the ease of use is a, is a really key piece for how we approach an implementation. So we, all, we talk about this as we call it the hidden persona. So you know, when we go and we do a website redesign, we'll go through the effort of defining all the different personas. Who are the key audiences that are using, using these sites, using these tools? But the way that we look at it is if we're not making the tools, powering these web experiences as usable, uh, then, then, then what are we doing? It's, it's going to fail. So we call that hidden persona really our, our marketer, our um, subject matter expert, the team that is actually building out and maintaining and scaling that content. So what we really strive to do is spend a lot of time upfront and ongoing designing for them because we feel like the technology should enable the experience, not dictate it. It should be a user experience first approach to how we build these applications for our, for our clients in healthcare, but um, we need to make sure that on the back end, the tools we're building from an authoring perspective are allowing them to easily scale and do the things they need to do based on our strategy, based on our user experience. So we do that really in, in three different ways. We call it a, a product playbook. So we're not just defining business business and functional requirements, we're also defining the Drupal experience needs and we build a roadmap around that. So um, we start with interviews at the outset of a project. Um, we'll conduct the stakeholder interviews with um, the key users that are using the application. So stakeholder interviews pretty common from a strategy perspective with various stakeholders, different departments, C-suite people, et cetera, within the organization from a marketing and brand perspective, but we wanna put equal emphasis on the authors and the people inside the tools to figure out, um, you know, with marketing and IT, what's working, what's not working. And we look at how we identify opportunities. We uncover pain points, you know, what features are in the current system that are error prone, that don't work well, that are cumbersome. Um, you know, both the quick wins and the longer term enhancements are things we wanna document and build a roadmap around. So we'll deep dive into the workflow of the authors. Um, not the workflow and how we think of CMS workflow, but like their actual day-to-day -day workflow. Because um, the, the reality is a lot of the folks who work with on the healthcare side have a million different things they're doing outside of just you know, maintaining the, the CMS and the site. So we wanna look at how their day-to-day -day operations work so that we can make it easier when they jump back in. You know, retention's a big thing, how do we, um, how do we um, make the system so that folks who aren't in it every single day can jump back in and retain the information and, and know what to do? Um, and then remove any friction points um, and formulate solutions for how we can remove them. So we'll look at things that are more time consuming or more, um, you know, have more friction and, 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 and more clicks and worse user experience that we then um, in turn figure out how we can make them do things faster, better, smarter. So after we take that Drupal requirements first approach, we install our distribution. So that's that 
code base that we've built a, um, you know, a uh, authoring environment with all the standard configurations. Um, and then we'll work to create a series of workflow and permission in a governance model for our authors. So sometimes it's a smaller team where it's very centralized, sometimes it's a bigger team where it's very decentralized, or a lot of times we'll hear we want to be more decentralized so we're not the bottleneck for content updates and we can let more people in. Um, so we work uh, very diligently to figure out how we can open up um, the permissions and the you know, right level of who can publish, who can approve, what does that workflow look like so that we can maintain that brand consistency but let more people update their pieces of content. Um, and then that's where we'll typically install our healthcare experience design system, um, which you know, we don't look at it as, you know, it's by no means a site in a box, it's a series of um, front end, back end components that we've built that we customize based on the user experience. So if um, we're doing a redesign and there's common components that we can reskin, great. Um, if it frees up budget so we can build you know, some really cool custom features that are totally new and unique to that brand, that's kind of the whole reason behind it. Um, and we are continuously maintaining it and we know it works. So um, what we do is we release and we iterate uh, early and often. So we onboard the authors together pretty early on in the process you know, using real content. So hands-on CMS training on-site in a mix of virtual, um, you know, when working with these healthcare organizations, there's usually a lot of different authors in a lot of different places, locations, et cetera. Um, so we try to be flexible with how we do that. Um, we put a really strong emphasis on CMS QA and customer experience optimization. So we build the curriculum around what the authors, um, what their day-to-day -day tasks are. We'll do, you know, more of the deep dive into the, um, you know, more of the admin super user kind of need to do it all training, but then we'll cater smaller training specific to um, you know, individuals that need to do just certain tasks. But the idea is that um, we wanna get our authors in the system early and get them in there often. So um, that way we can build in feedback loops and as they give us feedback and we have additional releases, you know, maybe we start with a homepage and five modules, maybe then we release a few tier pages, um, whatever that might be. Um, by the time we get to go live, the environment and the experience is really customized and tailor-made for these specific um, per, uh, authors within the organization. Sure. I can I see the logo on the bottom right on the top uh, with the link to the tool request PowerPoint there? Yeah, yeah. Um, you just took me my next point. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so what we did was um, there's a, a, an LMS company called WhatFix that we partner with, and we built a learning management module within Drupal. So. Essentially what, that, what this does is it, um, it allows you to log in and say, I wanna create an accordion. And it'll take you around the admin and show you exactly where to do everything. And it'll click you through step by step. So the reason why we did that was we wanted to try to increase retention. So a lot of our clients don't have the time or the bandwidth to train and train and train as people come in and out of an organization. And for somebody that has to do a few different, you know, more basic things, or this goes pretty deep, but just to make it so it's a little bit more self-service, um, we implemented these flows that, that, that do that. Um, and it also allows us to do things in there too, like videos and, and other help steps, but it's primarily meant to, or I should say mainly meant to guide you around the admin as if you're, as if you're um, on the phone with someone, you know, walking through it together. Um, So in terms of Drupal, Drupal at scale in healthcare, um, we'll talk a little bit about um, what that looks like from a health system perspective and some, some different things we've done that have been successful. So when we look at this, um, you know, of course we want, we want to take a, a modular approach. Um, what we can do that's more of a composable process, a more modular process um, that allows us to do more continuous improvements over time, um, allows us to make our upgrades easier, and allows us to um, you know, future-proof our MarTech stack essentially so that we can realize our roadmap, we can reala realize our digital strategy. But you know, what that looks like and what we're seeing more and more is we're having seen more and more health systems come to us that are um, building a central brand or a central health system. Maybe it's a new one, maybe it's an existing one, maybe it's one that's rebranded. And through a variety of mergers and other acquisitions are bringing more hospitals, more delivery networks, more locations into their brand ecosystem. So what we've, what we've started to do is build 
essentially a health system Drupal install. Um, and through uh, content distribution tied together by taxonomy, we can create um, hospital sites, clinic sites, location sites, um, all driven by this central database. Um, so, what, so what does that look like? Um, Catholic Health is a uh, health system we work with in Long Island. Um, they went through a rebrand and uh, a lot of uh, acquisitions of additional delivery networks and um, uh, various provider locations and we needed to build a system website for them but we also needed to build a series of hospital websites for them at the same time. So what we did was we started by building out marketing landing pages um, to introduce the new brand. Get some new media and market, try out the new brand, launch the brand. We then built out um, the public website and we also used that same experience to build out um, an intranet for them in Drupal as well. But what is the, the cool part is we have the system site that is the main, here are all the doctors, all the services, all the locations, find a doc, find a service, news, content hub. But then um, there's uh, eight or nine or so hospital websites, which is the one that's in the middle. So these live in Drupal in the same admin and we're utilizing the groups module to create these site experiences. So they all live in one place and they have their own unique navigation, um, uh, but it's their unique navigation, unique content, um, unique wayfinding results, but it's using all of the same common components and experience from the main health system. So um, a hospital can have you know, that unified brand identity, but if I wanna look for doctors for just this particular location, I can. If I wanna see events for just this location, I can and I can always link back to the system where I can see it all at the entire system level and other locations. So, you know, utilizing a few different modules such as groups and building out um, a, a pretty robust taxonomy system um, and various Drupal views and different functionality to tie it all together, um, we can create that brand consistency but also give every um, hospital a, a unique personality and also as more locations, as more delivery networks come online over time or, or get acquired, um, we've got a, a system and a solution in place that allows us to um, allows us to bring them on, and we'll we'll know what to do when it, when that time comes. The last thing I will leave you with is related to um, just overall cost of ownership. You know, this probably applies to more of the health health system side folks in the room, but um, you know, when we're looking at um, leveraging something that has a low cost entry point like Drupal, um, we wanna make sure that we're investing in the right places. So um, even when it comes to you know, the safest, most secure CMS frameworks, whether it's um, you know, Drupal open source or something else, um, we need to make sure that we're doing all the th right things to secure it inside and out. Um, we think that it's essential to deploy a team and a practice that's staying on top of security, it's staying on top of all the mod releases, the incremental major version upgrades, um, and you know, because Drupal's so versatile, um, it also means that you need to find the right partner. Um, whether that's building an internal team or an agency partner or both, um, having the right team to scale is definitely critical. Um, and as the platform is built to accelerate to scale, um, investing in the resources that can help you do that is what's gonna essentially help realize that digital strategy. Um, and you know, we really tell all of our clients that at the outset of a Drupal imp implementation, to really take the time to define what that three-year roadmap looks like because the beauty of what we can do with Drupal is that you know, it allows us to get in market more efficiently and allows us to in turn um, actually realize those strategies further out. So when we're starting to look at a CMS assessment and we wanna look at the, you know, what the different questions are to ask, you know, we, al we often ask our healthcare clients, you know, what are we, is it one website? Is it hospitals coming over time? Is it a system? Um, is there an intranet behind this? Because we wanna understand um, the size and the scale of this because you know, within a health system in particular, there's always locations that are changing, there's more that are coming online, um, there's other systems that can leverage Drupal internally, so we wanna make sure that we're, we're planning for that at the outside and making sure that we're finding the right solutions to do that. Um, and then you know, we also wanna look at all the third party apps and the different things that we're going to use to push content. So, if we're using a central Drupal database to um, manage the content, build up these websites, what are the different third-party tools that we have in place? What does it look like in the future with that roadmap? Um, because we wanna make sure that those are things we have integration points ready for and are able to scale with um, over time. 
And that pretty much wraps it up for, for us. Um, if you want to scan the QR code, we are giving away a free MarTech stack audit, um, which is totally, totally free. Um, tell us you know, what tools you're using and we'll tell you where we could find potential efficiencies and um, some recommendations where we could help or you know, where you could potentially consolidate and, and do more with less in Drupal. Um, I'm not gonna spam you with a whole bunch of marketing after I promise. Um, it's totally free, so uh, feel free to reach out. All right, any questions? It could be both, but it's typically something separate. Typically, we'll integrate with like a third-party credentialing database and then create a mapping and import those, you know, on, on a daily basis, you know, a few times a day, real time, whatever the requirement is, and it'll create the content type uh, for each provider in Drupal, and then it'll have all their information. It'll have, you know, their specialties, for example, that we use as taxonomy and their locations. So we then use that structured data and that tagging to create a taxonomy where we can, you know, syndicate the content by by hospital, and that applies to um, really any content, whether it's news, whether it's events, uh, whether it's specialties. But yeah, providers in particular are, are typically typically getting imported. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, depends on the size, but I would say it's probably 50-50 um, because what we tried to do was define the things that are standard that, you know, like a, like a, like a directory or accordions or cards or base content types, navigation, um, things that we know are tried and true and have been through usability testing and everything else that work. But then again, we don't want it to be a site in a box. We want to use it as a foundation, not a, you know, not a release valve. So. Um, then the idea is to, we've trained our UX teams and our creative teams on um, you know, what they are, when we change them, when we add to them, what is easy to change, what isn't easy to change, and then um, looking at the budget and the size and the scope, we determine, okay, this one's a little bit more of a reskin versus, okay, this one is mm -hmm. a very big custom project and we're gonna build all of these different tools and different features and just use this set. So it kind of it kind of varies, but yeah, maybe half and half. Components? Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, for you know, for a medium to smaller size component, yeah, it's probably, you know, probably more like seventy percent, you know, more of a more of a reskin. No, no, how many? Uh, how many components? How many would-be component components do you have on a medium size project? Oh, um, Jake, what do you think? We probably got like you know, probably seven or eight content types. You know, we try to build more. Fewer, more flexible page so content types. Yeah. 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 Typically, like you know, we'll have a we'll have like a widget library of like fifteen or so, mm -hmm. and then um, yeah, we'll have the different content types. A lot of times, when we get into like a migration um, from like an older D seven site, we'll see, you know, dozens of content type templates that. People have, you know, developers have built over time, which is just, you know, hard to maintain. It's hard for the authors to remember what to use. So we try to limit the page layouts to fewer, more flexible ones, and then have a bigger, uh, you know, widget module library that is more flexible. We can move things around. All right. Any other questions? Let me know. Appreciate it. Thank you. Up next, we have our second sponsor, Evolving Web. That's evolvingweb.com. 
Um, and Evolving Web is a fantastic digital agency, and I'm not just saying that because Alex is sitting right there. A fantastic digital agency combining creative excellence with solid technological, technological foundations. I've known Evolving Web from a time when it was the small but mighty combination of Alex and Cezanne, and today they are, and I will quote, an ever-growing team of 100 plus technologists, storytellers, and creatives to help give you the most powerful way for organizations to connect with their audience, which is a dynamic and adaptable digital presence. Throughout, they have been champions for their clients and consistent contributors to Drupal. Um, and their talk will be given today. Um, if you want to start setting up your computer, <laughs> realizing that always helps. Um, yeah, will be given by um, Morgan Gregay, um, which I murdered, but not as badly as I destroyed my own French last name, um, is the creative director at Evolving Web. Uh, every day, Morgan puts his strategic and creative skills to work to understand clients' objectives and make sure they are translated in the output of the creative teams. He defines visual territories to connect your organization to the people you need to reach and to differentiate you from your competitors. Uh, he will talk with us about crafting 20 websites with a seamless design system for the Provincial Health Services Authority. And if you're all nice, he might share about Evolving Web's work for Planned Parenthood in the lightning talks coming up later this afternoon. And we... Oh, right, yeah, so it's right now. Yeah, it's turned it on. Right now it's, it's mirrored, so okay. if you need to <laughs> jump into the screen settings or just settings generally and switch it to, uh, I guess it's this way. And Evolving Well will be joined by one of their clients for this, which is really exciting. <laughs> they can't get away with making anything up. Perfect. And yeah, now you should be able to see it. Yep. Yeah, we uh, <coughs> so we thought we were gonna do some rolls, yeah, have some smoke, and uh, maybe s some music as well. Uh, we thought we were gonna be at the end of the day. Yeah, we so thought we were gonna yeah, be at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. But so yeah, more seriously, um, thanks for for. You're, uh, for joining, for sticking around so long. Uh, we appreciate, appreciate your time. So um, we hope you find this useful. Uh, and, uh, and so yeah, we're here to present to you a, a design system we're uh, building for uh, 20 uh, different brands. So it's more of a design-focused uh, presentation. Um, 
so uh, yeah, I'm Morgan Deegan, as, uh, as you mentioned, and so I'm creative director at Evolving Web. And um, I'll step over. I'm Miley Conway. I'm a communications director at Provincial Health Services Authority, which is in uh, Vancouver, BC. So yeah, and it's true, it's a little bit of a special one because we're presenting as uh, the agency as well as the clients uh, together. So we're uh, super excited about this. So before we begin, I just did want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, that we are guests today on the lands of many uh, indigenous village sites in the Portland metro area. And I know indigenous people have been stewards of the lands and waters around us for thousands of years. And so we just wanted to take a moment to extend our gratitude. So to get us started, I'll share a little bit about uh, the Provincial Health Services Authority, which is a mouthful, so PHSA, uh, just to give some context for the work we're doing together. And so PHSA, or I guess in Canada, it's a, a little different, I know, the healthcare system in the US, so we are a publicly funded healthcare system, so all of our dollars come from taxpayers. Uh, so in British Columbia, we have uh, the way we operate our health system is there's five regional health authorities and they're kind of color coded on this map here. There's also a First Nations Health Authority and then there's PHSA. So I think what makes PHSA unique is we're the only health authority that has a province wide mandate to deliver specialized care and services. And uh, we have over 26,000 employees uh, across the province and we basically have a mandate that's sort of three different components. So the first is that we provide direct specialized care. So for instance, like pediatric care or cancer care, um, the highest levels of uh, mental health and substance use care, ambulance services. Uh, then secondly, we also want to make sure that the standards of care are consistent and high quality no matter where you live in the province. So we, um, we set clinical guidance and standards for a lot of um, different health services. So things like your standards for cardiac care or emergency care, um, including like communicable disease control. So that all falls under PHSA's mandate. And then third, uh, we, we help the healthcare system run behind the scenes. So there's a lot of services that we provide uh, on behalf of all of the health authorities. So for instance, we uh, oversee like IT, supply chain, um, and we also run some of the employee services that, uh, again, on behalf of the health authorities like payroll. So for all of the healthcare employees in the province. And so because of that mandate and sort of that mix of clinical direct care, the clinical guidance, and then the behind the scenes, we have a hybrid brand architecture. It's kind of a complicated one. So we have uh, programs uh, that have some major, some major brands that fall under our family. And then we also have some programs and services that follow like a PHSA sub brand. Um, to add to the mix, we're actually going through a brand identity <laughs> project right now for PHSA. Uh, but some of our program brands are, they actually are more well known to the public than PHSA itself. So for instance, like the BC Children's Hospital or BC Cancer, like those are, I think that's the, one of the challenges we're facing with this Web Renewal project is because those brands need to come through. Um, so what Morgan's gonna talk about with the design system is like so important to us because the brands have to be reflected in our site. So why are we doing this project? Um, we have, so at PHSA, we have over 20 websites. We have more than that, but there's kind of 20 core websites that are in our digital ecosystem. And they were built about 10 years ago, and they're in desperate need of renewal. Um, they kind of all follow a very cookie cutter template, um, even IA right now, and uh, it's not working. It hasn't been probably working for a while. So we knew we needed to get uh, to a place where we're in a going to allow for some future integrations with patient portals and there's going to be healthcare provider systems. So we needed to build a, you know, a long-term sustainable solution to uh, really just meet the needs that we're, we know are coming and to be in Drupal so that we can ha like find an environment that can actually bring all of our sites together. So we've set, uh, for a web renewal project, we've set three goals that we're um, focusing on. So first, we, we really want to create a culturally safe uh, accessible, inclusive, you know, welcoming digital experience. Um, as an organization, that's one of our top priorities. Uh, we also want to build a foundation that's going to be efficient and cost effective, because again, we're talking about taxpayer dollars. Uh, but we also, like all of those programs that I mentioned, they're so unique. They have different audiences, different goals. So we have to have that balance, but 
truly like the foundation um, is so important. And then third, we're, we need to set up content governance. Right now, it's, it's not in a good place and we wanna make sure that we're gonna give the sites, we're gonna put all this effort into renewing these sites. We wanna make sure that they're gonna be well maintained for years to come. So, how? All right, <laughs> so, so yeah, you heard Miley. Uh, so given that we have uh, more than 20 websites uh, in the pipeline, uh, by the time we'll be done uh, designing and uh, developing them, we'll be ready to retire, right? So <laughs> we want to avoid that at all costs. So how do we get there faster? Um, so design system, right, is, is a logical solution for this. And uh, the way that we define it is a set of reusable UI components and their respective code, as well as clear guidelines for the design development of an unlimited number of websites. And so how we break that uh, down is basically, so a set of reusable UI components. We've got the code and the guidelines, is, and it's really a three-part toolkit. Um, and so, uh, so exactly what we're talking about, right? So you have your design files, and I know it sounds obvious, but it's really important to really actually clarify what we're talking about. We've got the corresponding code, uh, which would be code snippets of each of the uh, components in the, in the design file. And then we've got uh, the guidelines that are a knowledge management system that explains how to use each uh, of these. So the design files, the code, and uh, trust me, you're gonna need these because, well, if you give, um, if you give these to 100 different designers and developers, you're gonna get 100 different uh, interpretations. So uh, guidelines are, are, are key. And what's important also to, to note here is that uh, it's really gonna help designers, developers, but also marketing team and content creators to uh, collaborate and have visibility on, on all the work. So uh, it's really powerful, with those three uh, parts of the toolkit. And yeah, so it's really gonna help with uh, reusability, right? So uh, first you're gonna make economies of scale. You uh, d design once and uh, use everywhere, and it's gonna make uh, the experience a lot uh, less risky because every time you start a new website, well, we start from qualitative uh, foundational elements, they've been tested. Um, then, of course, consistency, all the, the websites are gonna be more consistent, um, and, and, and that's gonna help with the user experience and then you know building that trust. Uh, and yeah, communication, I mean, I, I did mention it just before, and, and it's really one of the most underrated uh, uh, benefits of a design system, right? Communication, getting er all these teams uh, working on the same uh, platform, and so uh, they have to uh, communicate together, they have visibility on the work, so all the, so there is a common design language, uh, um, there is a common language that emerges, sorry, uh, and, and then, yeah, a common vision can emerge from that, so. Uh, but at the same time, we did mention, and Miley showed you guys the, the brand architecture, and in the way that we understand a design system and that it's mostly used, uh, generally it's gonna be with one brand, so scaling one brand across lots of different websites. But here in our case, we've got that complex uh, uh, brand architecture with lots of different brands. We've got more than 20. So um, we have to rethink a little bit the way that we approach the design system. Um, and so uh, Condé Nast is, it was a great example that, that, we, uh, that we found uh, where they uh, scaled multiple uh, magazines on different, uh, on different websites using the same components but styling them very differently using all the CSS variables, all the style variables and, and changing dramatically that, that brand expression. And so that's what we call uh, a multi-brand design system and we kind of mocked it up on uh, using the uh, P PHSA brands and, uh, and you see, so using the same components but changing the, uh, the, the CSS variables, all the style, uh, typography, size, color, imagery, all that can really uh, create that, that brand uh, expression and, and really uh, create a lot of differentiation and, and distinctiveness. But doing that uh, would still need a lot of, of tweaking and would not uh, save that much time uh, on design and development. It would, but not as much because we would still need to uh, well, look at uh, the, the style, uh, look at the, the different uh, the configurations and then make sure that the, the code doesn't break and then for maintenance as well. So there would still be quite a lot of time uh, involved. 
So then we looked at a cross-brand design system, which is where the, the design system is applied across all the brands. And this is, we, we marked it up on to see kind of how, uh, you know, to, to, to understand exactly what are the, the variables. And, but basically, you've got uh, a more uh, less, uh, uh, a more limited uh, flexibility in terms of style, and we would just use color and imagery to um, create that differentiation. But here's uh, an example of uh, early exploration that we've done for the design system, where you see uh, we looked at how we could use color to really create that differentiation. And, it, and you know, it, it, it does work. You can really go a long way if you think about it uh, ahead of time. And so how do we go about uh, creating that design system? So this is a little bit more of the process. Um, but you know, ideally, you'd want to start with a um, with a co universal component library, and then you would scale that on all the different websites, right? Wrong. We never want to <laughs> never want to design in a vacuum, right? You, you always want to start from a use case, and and in our case, well, it was a, a pilot website, so we want to flip the the script a little bit. Start from the pilot website to really uh, design based on on real content, real needs and then scale those uh, components into a universal component library and then start from that component library to create all the new websites. And so rest assured, the, the thing is that we're not stuck with the initial components from the, 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 the initial pilot website, right? So every time we create a new website, uh, we add all the new components to the component library so that the library grows and they are available for all, all the, the, the websites, the new ones as well as the old ones. And we're also creating a, a theme for the guidelines based on that component library. So there are some platforms to, uh, to do those guidelines, but we uh, were using the, this actual uh, component library to create the, the guidelines as well. And so yeah, we're happy to share with you uh, the progress we've made so far. Um, and uh, so one of the, the things that, that I mentioned earlier to create that differentiation was color and imagery. So uh, we defined that uh, we needed to come up with a system for, uh, to, to create that differentiation with imagery, and that was gonna be through icons. And uh, so the icons was one of the ways to do that. Uh, and basically how we did that is that we extracted from uh, the brand DNA, so you see you got BCHS, uh, BCMHSUS, BC Cancer, Children's Hospital, which are some of the, the brands, and we extracted from the brand DNA a visual language. So for uh, BCMHSUS, you've got a natural language. Um, for uh, BC Cancer, you've got a geometric uh, language, and a crafty, more crafty for a Children's Hospital. And these are taken from, from the brands. And then, uh, uh, overlay that with an icon, and, and that helps us uh, create a brand-specific icon that can be used on each of the different uh, websites. So they all look consistent, uh, but at the same time, they uh, enable uh, a clear uh, brand expression dif and differentiation. All right, and you see how it can really help unify the look, but at the same time, we're also applying that to imagery, so not just iconography, but also imagery. And uh, another side of it, in terms of how we uh, design the, the, the components, is that we drew inspiration from a telehealth dashboard uh, kind of a design approach. So stacking the components dynamically to really uh, uh, give that sense of uh, effectiveness, efficiency of the services given by uh, PHSA and BCMHSUS here. Um, but also uh, really easy access to information. So giving a lot of uh, affordance, making the, the component uh, really, uh, really clear. And also that dashboard uh, approach also inspired how we uh, designed the, the, the navigation. And in terms of typography, so this is, uh, that's uh, the less ideal, uh, I think, situation where we're using the, the same typography across all the brands. Typography is a, is a, a key element for, of branding, uh, but we chose it based on the fact that it was universal enough and that it would fit with uh, most brands. And also because of the fact that uh, it had a syllabic character set, which is the indigenous, uh, uh, an indigenous character set, which was one of the key, uh, which was one uh, really important uh, side of it. And <coughs> also, well, talking about indigenous uh, peoples, uh, we also created lots of uh, space 
for uh, indigenous uh, imagery. And we actually collaborated with a local artist to create an, an initial uh, set of illustrations. And yeah, that's our presentation. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, choosing the pilot website was really important. And um, so we chose it based on the fact that it was the most generic in terms of content. And also it was uh, smaller than uh, most of the websites. So we're tackling like much bigger websites after. Uh, but yeah, we chose it because we thought that it would be uh, the most, gen we would have uh, to design and tackle the most <coughs> universal and generic icon, um, the most uh, the component, sorry, that would scale uh, well on all the other websites. So a good starting point, yeah. Alex. So, well, great question. I don't know the exact number, but uh, I think it's it's round about the, the same. It's uh, it's round about like 30 or, or a little bit more, but it, it's quite a lot. We're starting from quite a lot. And so my follow-up is how many do you think you'll need by the time all comes online or brought online? It's a, a good question. Again, I think that based, you know, uh, we cannot, we don't know, but, you know, every time we start a new project, the discovery phase is going to inform how many new components we need, what are the, the use specific user needs. Um, so we, we can't really tell, but we definitely won't have to redo all the components. It's most likely going to be like a couple of new components for, for each website. So, Yeah. I would just add, actually, for us, that's like really important because we have a very small team in communications and we have a very small team in IT. So if we roll out these sites and they're too complicated, it's going to be very hard for us to maintain them. So I think that's, yeah, that's really important to us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you, Evolving Web. Um, now going to take a 15-minute break. And, and uh, yeah, when we come back, again, go to different tables. We'll have one more uh, quick like session of go-rounds. Yeah. Yeah, but this is what we'll do when we get back. So just pick different tables we'll, when you get back, and we'll do another round, and then lightning talks. And if you have to go, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, do you mind taking a picture? A picture? Yeah. Yeah. I guess Not I forgot <laughs> to ask Julian to take a picture while I was talking. Yeah. I'm just going to post it on my LinkedIn. So. Oh, yeah, perfect. And all of you guys can take well, this. That yeah. one is fine. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do the, this yeah. one just so they don't yeah. think it's over. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Thank you.
No, I'm just gonna stand here and I'm gonna act like I'm talking, but it's like weird. Nobody knows who's this, nobody there, so. Yeah, I'm just like acting like, oh.
Welcome back, everyone, to the final stretch of the health healthcare summit. I hate to interrupt all the talking with a request for more talking, but it's what we're going to do. Um, so we heard fantastic comments about favorite sessions. Um, and so now we're going to talk more in depth about your takeaways from DrupalCon. So yeah, please move around so there's at least six people at each table. So, jump around at two. You, you count to two. Um, so we are keeping you healthy and moving at the healthcare summit. Yeah. So we will. We'll just do. <laughs> we'll do about 20 minutes of discussion. Um, we'll just put both questions together, and then we'll do report backs. Um, so. Please do a round at your table so that everyone definitely talks. Um, and then, you know, since we'll be asking each table to briefly report back, try to keep track of the common themes and the most unusual answers to be ready to share with the group. Um, and so the question is, what is your top takeaway or top two takeaways from DrupalCon? And then what do you want to do next at your organization? And maybe you'll find someone in the room who else. Two rounds of
Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So yeah. you almost got yeah. it okay. but right after that. Yeah. No. I'll slip it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We, um, yeah, so just five minutes for a really quick report back from each table, and then uh, we'll have lightning talks, and then we should take discussion out into the sunshine because we will not need um, the screen anymore. Um, but yeah, we'll be officially over, but it would be awesome to keep talking. Um, so I'm going to steal the, my favorite takeaway from my table just to kick it off, but the, we are not alone. Like, we are trying to reach the same solutions, um, facing a lot of the same problems, um, and that was really nice to learn at this conference. Um, so yeah, um, please, someone... And anything for what you want to do next after DrupalCon. I heard recipes, and that's also something I want to do next after DrupalCon. Um, anything else? We also have visiting wine country um, and eating in Portland restaurants. But yeah. anything else? So we are still open for anyone who would like to throw their hat in the ring for a lightning talk, but up now we have Christoph. Um, so I should be letting you plug uh, in. And then, oh yeah, I got one here. Good. Oh, sorry. No, just away. Away. So. Okay, here we go. Um, so I got five minutes. I'll put my timer. Yeah. We'll give you six and a half. I'm <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be short. Um, so I, I'm here at this summit because I'm a bioengineer by education. Uh, and um, uh, I'm from Pronovix, and we are called so weirdly because I thought that we we're going to be a biotech 
um, and healthcare Drupal agency, but then actually we didn't. Um, th but uh, the, the thing I want to present to you is um, about developer portals. And um, uh, if you're, well, first question, do you have APIs? Who here has APIs? I think all of you have, right? So, and then what, what are you trying to do with them? Are you just using them for integrations or are you building ecosystems or, or something like that? You're, you're already at that stage building ecosystems or not yet? Some developer relations, any of that kind of stuff already? You, you, yeah. So when you are gonna get there, the thing I want to give you is that Drupal can be a really good tool for that also. Uh, Drupal can be great for documentation, there's some interesting work going around, um, uh, happening around docs as code in Drupal, <laughs> which is a methodology where you author the same way you would write codes, and then you can import into Drupal, and they can like bring documentation from a bunch of different places, do access control, all the usual stuff that you've seen for making marketing sites. You can also use that for for uh, managing APIs and API ecosystems. Um, so if and any of this stuff, all the green stuff are things that you would do in a dev portal, that's stuff you can do with Drupal. That's the key thing I want you to remember. Also, Drupal is recognized as a tool for that. Uh, this is uh, last week at um, the API Day Summit in New York. Um, uh, Marco Neil from Gartner uh, mentioned Drupal as, a, uh, a, together with Backstage, which is a Spotify product, um, it's a long story. But Drupal was mentioned as one of the tools that you can use um, for making great developer experiences, both on the inside and the outside. Um, and um, yeah, so and there's lots of really interesting developer portals out there already uh, that are built on top of Drupal. Um, that was one, well, two takeaways. One is, um, uh, yeah, if you're not really doing developer portals yet, then come later. But the key thing is that if you think, if you hear people talking APIs and documenting APIs, think this can also work in Drupal. That's the key takeaway. And then I want to uh, give you freebies. Um, one is we organized this conference, AI the Docs, which was um, on the intersection of APIs, AI, and documentation. And we had people talk about what they're doing today already with AI. Now, um, it's a paying conference. Um, like normally you have to pay for this to get access, but if you send me, if you connect me on LinkedIn and you send me a DM, uh, I can ask my colleagues to get you <laughs> through the back door. <laughs> so, um, and uh, yeah, also if you want to talk about, if you have somebody in your team or in your organization that wants to learn more about API ecosystems and developer experience and that kind of stuff, or if you're thinking about setting up uh, an API, internal API system, so that you can accelerate development inside, uh, like for making applications or something like that. Hit me up, always happy to talk. Uh, strategy, there's a lot of really meta things that uh, <laughs> I can share. I've, I've had a talk here about some of that. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, that's it, thank you. Okay. It was only four minutes. <laughs> So that, that's, uh, that's something actually we were talking about here at the conference. This is why one of the reasons that I came. Um, and uh, sorry, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why I came here. Um, um, uh, so I think there's an opportunity to take what we've learned doing developer portals and, and uh, documentation sites in Drupal and bring that back to the community. So we're, we're talking about that with uh, with the DA. Um, the so I think I think. The initiative we are looking at is um, automated importing from GitHub, uh, GitLab, into Drupal, so that we would be able to change the uh, the developer experience uh, for Drupal.org. Um, that, that's something we're talking about. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh. I got a mic. Okay. Wrong way. Sorry. <laughs> I got him the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys put that. I'm like, okay, I can't see what's going on over here. All right, let's see. Is that okay? All right, so let's put that over here. Okay. Okay. And then. I only do it on Zoom, right? So I don't really, you know, get the, the do you want to go first? Or do you want to take it out? Or you can, go. You want to go first? Then you can start. No, just keep getting, okay. yeah, keep working out. Right. I had like one image. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a, as my lightning talk, make a quick um, pitch for contextual consent, which is what I have been going for as far as like, the GDPR, the cookie law, and all of that stuff where people are just throwing like a big banner that's just like, here's everything that you could possibly agree to on our website, like, and select what you want. Um, and that's still like the dominant approach. And I'm like, we should only ask people for their consent for taking information when we actually need it. Um, and in the, you know, the, the term of art for that is contextual consent. Um, and I think Drupal has really well set to do it. I've done it in little ways for a, a module called dismissible blocks. Um, so like if you have a, a banner alert, like when you close it, you can say, I wanna keep this closed. And at that point, you need to be like, and I agree that you save a cookie so I can keep this thing closed. And that's, uh, that's it, contextual consent. Um, if uh, you feel like you can build more trust by just having you know, the message at the bottom saying that we will only ask you for your data when we need it, instead of like the big banner pop-up type of thing. Um, I would love to work with you on that. Mm -hmm. Yay. All right, I figured it out, yay. Okay, so this is from UCLA Health, and I know this is like Georgiana's favorite feature that she was, she talked a little bit about in her presentation, but. Um, we thought we would expand on it. So, um, it's team member pages. Oops. So, you know, the issue you always have on sites is um, bio pages. You know, you need to have, like, leadership pages. So, part of the problem is, you know, you want to list people throughout the site. We have providers. We have cancer center members. We have other staff people without profiles. So, how do you get these onto the site, especially because you don't want to reuse, you don't want to recreate provider profiles like on another separate page. Um, sometimes you want to put them on a page and you're going to have separate sections and you want to have headers with the sections. And then you have somebody like, you want to have them not sorted alphabetical. So you want to have Dr. Titella, your director at the top and he's not A. So you need to make it very flexible. You need to make them very easy to you know, create and to maintain, like Georgiana was saying, is, you know, in our case, you, um, Dr. Titel leaves by chance, and he's on 30 different pages, and how do you instantly know where they are, and how do you get rid of them? So once he is archived, it disappears off of the page, all the pages. <laughs> then, so what we did is we created a new content type for a team member, and we have components for what we call team list block. And so when you do these, you can create them um, and you can pick a provider, you can pick a cancer center member, or you can create a team member as you know, a, a person that does not have a provider profile. And um, we have different card styles. So there's on that first page, we had like the small card version, we have a summary version, and then we have another one that's called just the provider card, which is what we use in, you know, for the provider directory. Okay. Three, four. So we also made it, we extended it um, recently to have create these bio pages. So when we created the Sims Man Center, we had a lot of these like leadership pages. And before they were just creating them as separate pages. 
But now you can just take the team member, you can say, I want to enable the bio page, and then you can put all the information inside of there and it creates a separate page for it. And then, what else do we have? Um, we also, and so these are part of the things that Georgiana was mentioning. Then they can actually be referenced in an article as well. So you can see here we have provider, but we also have team members. And so these people do not actually have profiles to go to, whereas a provider would have one. But they are um, part of the taxonomy. They're part of the, so they can be tagged. And then we also have cute things like animals. So animals are obviously not going to have necessarily profiles. So um, these are their support animals. <laughs> so um, we use them as a team member. Yep, yep. So this is that's this was a solution for this uh, this problem that we had because obviously you're not going to have a uh, profile. They're not going to have somebody to click through. Um, but this was a way to build like a whole page full of their support animals. So, what's that? Yeah. Oh, does he? Yeah, that wasn't enabled at the time. Yeah, they could. They could now because we have that new function. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, Abby, is this Abby? Lee's Abby? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize that was the Abby. You know. Yes. Anyway. Anyway, so this is one of the solutions that we um, have provided on UCLA Health to deal with the problem where you have all these biographies. You want to put them in different places, but you obviously don't want to put them in static pages and then have multiple places where you're using them. Um, and then you don't always have the simple, like, oh, I want to build a view, you know, and then it's like, well, now I want to break them up into sections and things like that. So anyway, how long did that take? Five minutes? Okay. Yay. Cool. All right. If no one else, yeah. Heck yeah. All right. <clears throat> you were nice enough, he agreed to do it. Yeah. Uh, while Morgan's setting up, I'll just, I'll just intro. So uh, thank you for this bonus sponsored, non-sponsored speaking opportunity. Uh, we're excited to share with you one of our proudest achievements of last year. We launched a uh, simple but not so simple uh, marketing website for Planned Parenthood Direct, which is a subsidiary of Planned Parenthood, uh, Parenthood uh, Federation of America. Uh, and this is their telemedicine team. It's about a 30 person tech startup within Planned Parenthood that provides a, an app to provide uh, subscriptions to birth control and, and abortion pills to people in states where it, it is legal, but for whatever structural non-legal reason, the, the person cannot access a doctor and cannot access the, 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 the medication that they need and the birth control methods that they need. As, a, as an American who moved to Canada 20 years ago, I was watching, you know, reading the New York Times and, and just my blood was boiling hearing about the stuff that's happening. And when one, uh, a friend from the Dr New York Drupal community reached out to me saying, for the last five years, I've been a, the head of this company and I, I'd, li I'd like you to help. I, I jumped on the opportunity to collaborate with them. Uh, they asked us to, to build uh, a, a Drupal powered decoupled site uh, where the front end is in React and it's static and it's Next.js. It's hosted on Pantheon. Um, Pantheon gave them an amazing price because it's a, it's a very budget constrained organization and every dollar goes a long way. Uh, so we're, we're happy that it turned out so well. We're happy that it seems to be a very secure solution because it's of the static generation that the actual code is blocked behind a VPN and IPF uh, restrictions. So you can't access the, the back end, which is theoretically hackable uh, compared to the static stuff on, on um, AWS or in this case, Google Cloud. And uh, so Morgan was our lead for the design process and he'll talk about uh, some of the work he did there. Thank you. Guess who's back? <laughs> yeah. All right, so yeah, thanks uh, Alice, Alex for the intro. All right, so let's look at how we approach the design of the, of the website. Um, so 
Alex, you did give the context of the of the app. The, so basically, Planned Parenthood has created an app that enables people to order some uh, contraceptives right from their home, from the app. Um, and so basically, here's how we went about it. First of all, we, we looked at the brand, all their brand assets, and, and, we, and, and right away we saw that, well, they had two different tones of voices, very different actually. So you have an educational tone of voice and an advocacy tone of voice. And we were wondering, so which one should we use to really uh, reach the, the target audience for this and, and do something that really resonates with them? Because these are really two uh, different different tones. And uh, so we thought about that with, uh, with our clients, the lovely clients at Planned Parenthood. And, um, and, and we were wondering, well, uh, and, and we looked at the, at the target audience, which are in this case, uh, young adults. And we thought, well, maybe, you know what, maybe neither of these would really resonate with, with the audience. You guys hear me well? <laughs> I was like really close from the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, and so uh, neither of these would actually really resonate with them, and specifically in the context of ordering contraceptives. Um, and this is actually something that is really uh, a cornerstone of our uh, design approach, and it's really to uh, align what makes the brand different with uh, what resonates with the target audience, right? So you really want to align the brand identity with the audience's identity. And this is really how you're gonna get a, a relevant brand expression. And it's really uh, flipping the, the, the perspective in a way. You know, and this is something that we really strive to do every time because it ensures that we get uh, something that's really relevant and that really helps achieve our goals. Um, so, and how we do that, we don't change the brand identity, right? But we're gonna use that and flex it in a way that is gonna be more relevant. So use it in a more appropriate way. Um, all right, and in this case, it was really to uh, uh, create a, a, an environment that felt more like, or that was inspired by uh, social media. So making it really visual, very colorful, uh, using bold graphics. And so, uh, so here's how it all came together. And first of all, first thing to note is that we had a, a mobile first approach. So we designed it first for mobile, and then uh, we created the, uh, the desktop uh, 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 layouts. And so uh, for the hero, so we did the art direction of the, of the photography that's, uh, that's on the hero. And the idea was to, have, um, was to have a person reach out in their pocket and taking out a box of contraceptives. And the, and the idea here is that the, the pocket is actually a very personal area. And so, uh, ha uh, you know, zooming in on this uh, really, really gives that notion that it's, it's a personal thing, it's a contraceptive, and then putting a, a, a render of the UI right next to it really signifies that from the app you can download and, and, and order those uh, contraceptives. Um, okay, so another thing we did is we uh, created a set of, uh, gra uh, of, uh, of patterns um, that are, first of all, well, they're, they're really beautiful, they're really colorful, so they help, you know, with the visual aesthetic of the website, but also, uh, and, and more importantly, they help Planned Parenthood communicate about the products that people are gonna be able to uh, get on, on, on the app, through the app. And, and also, they uh, enable them to communicate about these, but in a, a decomplexed way, you know, a very destigmatizing way. So that's, that's really important. And they also create a very nice, uh, series uh, that we can scale on, on all the pages. And uh, so because they had to work uh, on mobile and desktop, that's the reason why we actually made those uh, patterns square. Uh, you see that, that how they work together. Uh, something else that we did, so we create these uh, bold graphics for to support each of the key calls to action on the pages. Uh, so, and they were really meant to act as a thumb stopper, right, as you're scrolling through, really a thumb stopper, that's a thing, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and so basically, so you see good examples here, so uh, whenever, so like for example, inviting people to download the app, so we have that, the, those graphics, uh, become a tester, that's a tester uh, for uh, the app itself, not for, for products, <laughs> we've had that question, so I'm just <laughs> specifying. Um, okay, so another thing that, that we've done actually is uh, so created a set of, uh, of stickers uh, for, for, for that, that live on the website. Digital stickers. 
digital stickers, exactly. And what they do is that they enable uh, to, to add that, uh, that messaging so that uh, advocacy me messaging, supportive messaging, educational messaging, but mostly supportive and advocacy. Um, so, for example, you see on, uh, on, on, on the testimonials, you would have something that is more advocacy-based, so uh, uh, have fun, stay safe. Uh, on the blog, you would have something that's more supportive, be strong, be heard. And it gives a bit of spice and youthfulness you know, thr throughout the experience, and we use them also as a placeholder uh, thumbnail. So if uh, they wanted to publish really quickly with and they didn't have a, an image, they can just go ahead and, and use these. We created also uh, illustrations that really uh, explain how, how to use the app so people uh, can uh, know what to expect when they download the app. And then a more functional uh, FAQ section. And that is it. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're incredibly proud of this work and uh, so we're also very grateful that Tatian featured this project as a reason to give us the Social Impact Award at the Partner Summit. And we're also grateful that Tatian is providing a great decoupled hosting infrastructure that, that is powering this thing. So let's, let's get some of them some of the credits next too. And if you guys would like to uh, learn more, we're helping organize a, a regional summit in, in September in New York City called Vault Drupal NYC. Um, and we'll invite Planned Parenthood to, to, to give a, a feature talk. So we want to thank you all for coming and hang until the end here. We're going to let you go a little early. Uh, I know I'm going to hit the road, but uh, appreciate you all coming out and uh, contributing and participating. I think it's really important, and it's great to learn from everybody else. It's about time you get that up there, Ben. We're going to be yeah, done. We're done. Yeah. I don't know why. Where, where, but whatever. Yeah. Did you have anything you want to say? No. <laughs> so um, great end to the DrupalCon. So, appreciate you all coming. And a uh, huge thanks to the tireless organizers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, thank you, Ben. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And I'll be heading outside and then to the Blackwater Bar Vegan Restaurant. Which they have a lot of here. Yeah, yeah. Because they ran out of lunch for me. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Nah.